Hello everybody, we are back. I am Tim with Golf Cart Garage. It is Thursday, November the 4th. It is noon Central Standard Time. We are back as usual. We're going to try to answer some email questions from, that we get here at Golf Cart Garage, that we get them all week long. We get lots of questions. We're gonna see if we can help some people out, see if we can save some people some money, and uh, let's get started. Let's see, question number one. This is from Dan. It says, I have two Trojan T105 six volt batteries used in the toy hauler camper with 200 watt solar panels. What is the best winter storage practice? Leave them in the camper and let the onboard converter keep them charged or bring them indoors and put them on a battery maintainer. Well, I understand what you're talking about. Like the, the systems in RVs and campers, they have, a, they have an onboard uh, it's actually a converter slash charger. Uh, and all you have to do for winter storage which to think about is all you have to keep in mind is that a fully charged battery will not freeze. Uh, so I would just leave it in the camper. If, as long as you can leave electricity going to the camper, your batteries will be fine through the winter because the, the, onboard, co the onboard charger slash converter is actually gonna keep the, 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 the batteries charged. And if they, if they stay charged, as long as your electricity is not lost in your camper, they should stay charged and they'll be fine. Uh, so that, that, that's the way that I would do it. That would be the easiest way, the least amount of trouble. Okay, let's go to number two. Question two from John. I have an older EasyGo cart, 2000 or 2001. The red lights gauge second bar from the left was blinking when it was supposedly finished charging. What does that mean? Thank you. Well, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're talking about uh, the battery gauge on the dash of the cart. And if that's the case, there's definitely something is something has changed because that's not that's not supposed to be good. That's not supposed to that's not supposed to happen. So what I would recommend is I'm going to need some I would need voltmeter readings off your batteries just so I can verify that your car actually was getting charged. Uh, another thing I would do is I would plug your charger in to the cart and have a voltmeter ready and put the voltmeter on your batteries as the car is charging and you should see the numbers you know rising with the charger running if the numbers aren't rising your charger's not working so we need to verify that your charger is actually charging the cart is, is basically what we need to do first all right number three this is from david i have a 2011 yamaha cart with 14 inch wheels and a five bolt pattern a five bolt lug pattern i'm thinking about getting a 2022 they have a four bolt lug pattern on 10 inch wheels how can I move my old wheels to the new cart? Would there be fit issues and what parts would I need? If, if you have a Yamaha cart with a five lug pattern, then you don't actually have a golf cart. You have, because all regular golf carts have a four lug pattern. What you must have is something from Yamaha's utility lineup. If it's a five lug pattern on your wheels, you must have one of their utility cars. It's not actually considered a golf cart. Yamaha, you know, all the manufacturers, the three major manufacturers, Club Car, Easy Go, and Yamaha, they have the regular golf cart line, but they all have a utility line also. It's a little bit more heavy duty than a golf cart. It's not really intended to be used to playing golf because it's more of a heavy duty piece of equipment that they use around the golf course for maintenance and stuff. So it's gonna be built completely different I would imagine than the, the than a regular golf cart, and I don't know of an adapter kit or anything that you could put on a five lug pattern to to put four lug rims on there. So I'm, I don't I don't think you're going to have any luck figuring that one out. If you do, let me know because I'd like to know if there's something out there to help you do that because they're two completely different cars. Number four, what causes my Yamaha to backfire sometimes? Well, I'll tell you what I have seen. I have seen where in a gas car, everything's fine, you take off, you ride around, everything is cool, 
everything seems to be fine, you start going down a hill, like a steep hill. So you let your foot off the gas because you don't want to go a lot faster. So your car is going down the steep hill, and as soon as you touch your foot back on the gas, pow, backfire. What causes that, that particular type of backfire that I have found can be the, believe it or not, the idle screw. Okay, now I know a golf cart does not idle. You know, they, they crank every time you touch the gas pedal and then you let off. But if the idle, it does have an idle screw on the carburetor though. If the idle screw is turned too far in, when you let off the gas and you're going down the hill, it's still pumping fuel. It's still actually pumping fuel past the carburetor. And as soon as you touch your foot back on the gas, boom, it ignites all that fuel and causes a backfire. Now that's what I've seen before. I don't know if that's your symptom uh, of your backfiring issue or not. But if, it's, if you're backfiring just randomly and it has nothing to do with going down a hill, it could be something completely different. But it's almost always going to have something to do with your carburetor. So you're going to have to probably clean your carburetor out. Okay, let's see. This is number five. I have a club car, 48 volt, that tries to take off when you press the gas pedal but will barely roll. All batteries are good. Okay, well in 2005 you could have two different types of electrical systems. You could have, if your car is an IQ system in 2005, then I would be, I would suspect the speed sensor as being your, your issue. What you can, uh, the way you could test that, uh, just a without any meters or anything, you can kind of, it's a very simple test for a speed sensor. Put your car in, you know, turn the key off and your car's in forward. See if you can push your car. Because if it's an IQ system, if everything is working and it's an IQ system, if you try to push a golf cart and roll it on flat ground, it'll start beeping and it'll start holding you back and it'll start braking. If you're able to push it and the car freewheels, it's very likely you have a bad speed sensor. That's just a simple test you can do. If it's not an IQ system, if it's a 2005, it's not an IQ system, then that means it's a series wound system in 2005. And your issue could be caused by your M core, which is responsible for your acceleration curve. So that would be my, that'd be my guess on that one. Let's see, number six. Why is there voltage between positive and negative battery terminals and the frame on my club car DS? Negative terminal to frame is 24 volts, positive terminal to frame is 17. I've actually seen that before. It's, we used to call it just uh, ghost voltage. Uh, what, the, what most people say to do is clean your car, believe it or not. They, they want you to get all the dust and the dirt off the top of your batteries because uh, you, can, you can have stray ghost voltage connections that's following dirt. You can have, obviously it could be a wire you have somewhere that's touching the frame that could be causing it. I've never seen it actually cause any issues. I've never seen it so severe that it caused any issues, but I have seen what you're talking about. I've never really pinpointed it except the only thing I could ever do was I would always make sure the tops of my batteries were clean and, and there was no connection, no possible way that I was getting any type of parasitic connection to anything. So that would be my advice on that. Let's see, number seven. I'll be away from Maine for five months this winter. The 2005 DS electric car will be in my garage. What should I do for storage? Disconnect battery by a trickle charger. Keep regular charger plugged in. Where should the tow run switch be? Well, if it is a 48 volt car, so you, get, you didn't tell me if it's a 36 or a 48, you could have either one in that year. If it's a, if it's a 48 volt car, that means it has an onboard computer on board. The way that that onboard computer works is it tells your charger what to do. It tells your charger to come on, tells your charger to shut off. It does a lot of other things as far as keeping track of data, but it, one, one other thing that it does is that if your car is sitting there and you plug it into the charger and it fully charges your car and then it shuts off and you leave for five months and you left it plug in or whatever, 
if nothing happens to your electricity, if you don't have any type of electricity blink or there's no, there's no interruption at all, every 14 days that charger actually will come back on and charge your car again. So you don't really need to do nothing if everything's working correctly. Now, if it's a 36 volt car, that means it does not have an onboard computer and none of that applies, none of that works. The way the 36 volt car charger works is that it charges the car fully charged, then it shuts off and that's it. It isn't doing anything when it shuts off. It's not trickle charging, it's not gonna come back on, it's not gonna do anything unless you physically unplug it and plug it back into the car, then it would. Now, in that case, if that's what you're, what you're dealing with, then you're gonna need, you could think about buying another charger like with a storage mode function on it that will keep your car charged through the winter, like a Lester Summit 2, like right here. This, this, these chargers we sell, we're the number one seller of Lester Summit 2 chargers. And they have a storage mode function just specifically for your application. It will keep your car charged up through the winter and you wouldn't have to worry about it. You could also use that Lester Summit 2 on the 48 volt car that we talked about before if you wanted to. Let's see. Number eight, I have a EasyGo 1998 TXT. Car ran when I winterized it. By when I winterized it, I unhooked the batteries. When I hooked the batteries back just now, cart will not operate and also will not charge from the normal charger. All right. Well, that tells me something right there. Uh, the fact that it won't charge. And I'm, obviously I'm assuming that you did remember to hook your charging receptacle back up to the correct spots. But since it won't charge, it tells me that it's very possible that your batteries have gotten too low. If a, if your, if a golf cart's battery pack is too low, the charger will not come on because a, a lot of people don't realize this. They, their charger is AC into the wall. You plug it into AC but it's DC activated. So in other words, when you plug it into the plug, the DC voltage coming out of the receptacle into the plug is what turns the charger on. Well, it has to sense a certain amount of DC voltage in order to turn itself on. And if your battery pack is too low, it's not gonna turn itself on. So the, in your case, because it won't charge, that's the first thing that I need to, to eliminate. I need to figure out what the voltage in your batteries are. So you need to take a voltmeter and go down each one of your batteries and you don't have to you don't have to disconnect anything you can leave everything hooked up everything can be hooked up just take take your leads positive and negative on each pole of each battery make sure you have at least six volts i mean because you, you have six volt batteries in there if you have six volts in there then we'll go on it might be something else but i have a feeling that you're not going to have six volts okay number nine this is from david my newer golf cart is, is a Yamaha G22, has a lift kit on it too. I do not know the brand other than it's a Jake's lift kit. It's a bit unstable and I fear rolling it. Could that mean it needs new shocks? Well, I can tell you this on a, on a Yamaha. Yamaha does it different. Their, their rear suspension is different than Easy Goes and, and Club Car. Yamaha uses coilover shocks in the rear. And because of that, when you lift a Yamaha, they don't have the leaf springs like Easy Goes and Club Cars do. They just have shocks with coilover springs on the, on the slide and onto the shock. That's what is, uh, sturdies the car. When you lift a Yamaha and you make it top heavy, you know, it, they, it's that, uh, the, the ability for it to sway back and forth is greatly exaggerated. That's why almost every time a person puts a lift kit on a Yamaha, it's always recommended to go with heavy duty springs. You can remove those springs off of those shocks that are on your car and you slide on a set of heavy, in fact, you said it's a Jake's lift kit. In fact, Jake's makes those springs that I'm talking about also. So you can get heavy duty springs, slide onto the shock, and that will keep your car from being uh, loosey goosey as far as swaying back and forth. Let's go to number 10 here. This is from Jamie. I replaced the solenoid in my 2013 Club Car Precedent. Now the charger won't kick on when plugged in. Charger was working fine prior to the solenoid change. Well, 
this is one of those cases where I would need to be absolutely sure that you hooked every wire on the solenoid back up correctly when you change the solenoid because just changing the solenoid should not have affected your charging circuit whatsoever. Now, keep in mind that there are there are three other wires besides the two big wires that are that connect to the solenoid on your car, the two the two big posts. Besides those two big wires, there's three small wires, three other small wires, and a precharge resistor that goes across the two big terminals. There's three other small wires connected to that solenoid. So you might want to go back and double check that you didn't leave one of those wires off. One goes to the M core, one goes to the run tow switch, and I think the other one may go to the uh, uh, controller. So you might just make sure that you, you got all your wires back connected because just changing the solenoid should not have affected your charge circuit. Okay. This question is from Jim. I have a 2008 club car precedent that I got from a friend. It had been stored inside a barn for several years unused. Naturally, the batteries were toast, so I bought four new 12 volt batteries. Installed them and off I went. When the batteries got low, I plugged the car into the charger and tried different chargers that I have and the relay in the charger clicks, but the needle either doesn't move or actually appears to try to move in the wrong direction. Now that's a key right there. The charger stays like this for a few seconds, then shuts itself off, waits for a short period of time, then repeats this cycle, this whole cycle again. Most of the time when people hear about a club car, 48 volt club car, in, in your case, a precedent, having a, a charging issue, they automatically jump on the onboard computer. But because your needle, because you said that your needle appears to be trying to go in the wrong direction, I've seen that before and it turns out that's a diode issue. It's a common thing. Uh, your charger for that car has a, what is called a diode slash rectifier in it. It's the, it's the way that they use the diodes in that particular car. They don't have, all the diodes are on one block instead of having separate diodes like some of the older chargers would. Now, I have seen that many times that if it's a if the if the needle tries to go in the opposite direction and it's like it's being forced in the opposite direction and then the circuit breaker on the charger will pop sometimes or it will just cycle and do the same thing again like what you're saying. It was it could possibly be a diode issue. So, I think you may have a problem with your charger. I'm going to say that before we jump onto your onboard computer as being the issue. Number 12. I've been having some issues with my cart. I replaced all batteries, the solenoid, replaced pre-charge resistor assembly board. This was clearly bad. My lead cable going to the A2 terminal and motor burned off. I made the repair. Cart drive fine for a day or two. My next visit out to the property, moved, went to move the cart, wouldn't move. I hear my solenoid clicking. I did a field test on the A2 lead terminal coming from the solenoid to the motor gets very hot, hot. What causes that lead cable to get hot and what could cause my cart to go, not go now? Thank you for any help you can provide. Well, you didn't tell me exactly what kind of cart you have. So, but because you said pre-charge resistor assembly board, I think I know what cart you have. I think it's going to be an easy go DCS because it has a, an assembly board with the pre-charge resistor in it uh, connected to the uh, solenoid. Now, if you, and when you said you made the repair to the A2 terminal, what do you mean by that? You, what, what did you do to make the repair? Because there's lots of things that can go wrong with an uh, easy-go DCS cart. Uh, one of the main things that can go wrong with them is the controller. Uh, I replaced probably more controllers and DCS cars than any other cart that over the years, any other cart out there. I replaced more DCS, easy go DCS controllers, not PDS, but DCS controllers than any other controller out there. That was easy go's first attempt at regenerative braking cars and it worked for, they only used it for a short period of time, like I think two or three years before they switched to the PDS system, which is an improved version of their regenerative braking car. So, and if you've got a cable that's getting hot, then re replace that cable. I have seen cables that were, they look perfectly fine, 
But when you start putting current through them, they're, they're already degraded on the inside of the insulation. It could be because of corrosion or just repeated heat cycles over and over, heat and cool, heat and cool, and the metal actually degrades. So a cable can go bad and look fine. So if you've got a cable getting hot, replace that cable and see if that changes anything. Uh, if not, you may have gotten something in the motor that's messed up. It's going to be controller, the cable, or the motor, or where you made that repair on the A-terminal. Well, it's going to be one of those three things. All right, let's see. I have a 2007 club car precedent, electric golf cart. Recently, I've noticed that when I push the gas pedal down, that it kind of jerks around like it's not making contact. If I push the pedal all the way down, it works fine, but trying to regulate a slower speed or backing up is very jerky. Well, I know you hear me say this a lot, but that's a classic symptom of an M-Core issue, is a uh, cart being jerky at one point in the pedal uh, operation, like at one, like at a slow point, cart being jerky, push down, it may even fall out, push all the way down and it runs fine. That's a classic M core issue. Uh, you replace your M core and I think you'll, you'll find that it'll clear everything up. M core is a sealed unit. There's, but they're apparently they're not all 100% sealed and they get water in them sometimes and causes them to do some weird stuff. The, the M core is what tells your controller what to do. Your controller tells your motor what to do. So you've got to have those three devices, uh, you speak in the same language, in other words. The, the m core has got to talk to the controller, the controller's got to talk to the, to the motor. So that would be what I would say is wrong on that issue. Number 14. This is from Andy. I have a 2007 EasyGo TXT with six 8-volt Trojan batteries. Just recently when I plug it in, it will not take a full charge and eventually dies out when the green light on the cart goes out and the charger blinking slowly with a single red light. Cleaned all the battery connections and visually inspected all the wires. I'm not sure what else to try. I may borrow a friend's charger to see if that is the problem. Any other suggestions? Well, it looks like you were already on to my suggestion. I, I would definitely borrow a friend's charger to see if that's the problem. And if not, then we'll go back to your, your cart because uh, that's a fault code, you know, specific to your charger, the blinking red light, you could look up your fault code and see what it's saying. Uh, but it would be good to have battery readings off your batteries when you do this also. If, you're, if you get your friend's charger, if you use it and it does the exact same thing, then definitely take battery readings off your batteries and give me a call at Gearheads On Demand or set up an appointment to talk with me at Gearheads On Demand from at Golf Cart Garage homepage. Let's see, number 15. I have an 85 Easy Go Marathon two stroke. I store it indoors over the winter and really haven't used it till this past summer. I checked compression multiple times and consistently saw 25 psi. I am assuming I need a new piston and rings at the minimum. Well, I can tell you what, 25 psi is too low. It's not, it's not going to run at 25 psi. They'll run somewhere. Uh, I've seen a run at 80 to 90 PSI, so you're quite a ways off. So you are correct. You're going to need piston and rings at a minimum, but you're going to have, to, I, I wouldn't order that right off the bat because you may need more than that. You're going to have to pull your cylinder off, make sure your cylinder is still within tolerance for your new piston and rings because you may, you may need to get a bore job and bore out and go to an oversized piston and ring set. Uh, to, to, if you, in fact, you should probably do that anyway on a car that old. If you don't think it's ever been done, you should probably do that anyway. Go one size over and you'll be back to brand new again. I mean, they're, they're really good cars when everything is right. A lot of people do slap a piston and ring in there and they don't do anything to the cylinder and it works for a while, but that's just going to continue to be a shorter and shorter and shorter time that it's going to work because your speaker, the cylinder is constantly getting, uh, oblong and it's out of round. It's constantly getting out of round. That's what a bore job does. Is it makes sure that that hole in the cylinder is perfectly round. Then the piston fits back in there. The one size over piston goes back in with the one size over rings. Everything's back to new again. That's what I would do. 16. How do you test the control module? 
I'm going to assume that what you're talking about there is the controller. There's, there's not a real good simple bench test for a controller. So I can tell you what they do in 99% of all the golf cart shops across the world. We eliminate everything else because there's a way to test for everything else as a problem. Like you can test the motor, you can test the M core, you can test the batteries, you can test the key switches, you can test the micro switches. But a controller is a little bit more difficult on, uh, as a general statement, it's more difficult. Now on some electrical systems, like series electrical systems, it's not that, not that difficult. But we eliminate the solenoid clicking, you know, if the solenoid's clicking, and the, we know the motor's good. Well, the only thing really between the solenoid and the motor is the controller. So that's, that's, that's how it's generally done. Uh, now, I'm sure that if you had all kinds of fancy fluke meters and all kinds of, uh, all kinds of really fancy equipment, you could, you could figure out that there's a way to test it. And, you know, there's a way to bench test them. But the average person is going to be a difficult job. So the way that we do it, in, like I said, in golf cart shops, we eliminate everything else, and if the only thing left is a the controller, then, this, and then, then the controller is your problem. All right, let's see. Number 17. I have a club car. When you take off, it will hesitate, then take off, and you can feel it slow down, then back up. Can you give me any suggestions on what's going wrong? Well, if, if it ever goes to full speed and then drops down, like, you know, it goes to full speed or, or acts normal and then just, boom, just immediately drops down, then it, it is, that's a classic speed sensor issue. But if it's just constantly varying and going all over the place, no matter where you have your foot, then that's going to be your M core issue, you know, that, that, that I talk about a lot for them. Okay, let's see number 18. Brakes are really grabby, almost puts you through the windshield. Really touchy, stops on a dime, squeals when stopped. Well, I would have some questions, Nancy, uh, about that. Uh, did you recently install a lift kit? Did you recently make any changes to your suspension? Because I have seen lift kit installations where they didn't exactly take in, the, the lift kit itself didn't exactly take in the, cons, under consideration, the length of the brake cables, and the lift kit actually tightened the brake cable, and therefore pulled a little bit on the brakes in order for you to install the lift kit, and therefore when you touch the brakes, they're very, very sensitive because they're, they're, they're already dragging on the inside of the hubs, you know, and then you touch the brakes and the wheels lock up and everything. I've seen that, so I'd have questions, was anything done? If nothing was done, then I would, then it may be as simple as taking your brake hubs off, cleaning them out, roughing them up with sandpaper, blowing your brakes out, getting the dust out, because a lot of times the dust can build up in there to the point where this can happen. Uh, water can, believe it or not, water can cause this to happen because it will rust inside your brake hub, and then you're, you're basically hitting rusty metal onto rusty metal. So blowing it out with an air hose sometimes can help that too. So I'd have questions for you about that before I could answer that. Let's see. Let me go over to Facebook and YouTube and see if there's any any questions. Oh, okay, I've got there's some on, on Facebook here. My club car DS loses power when going uphill. This is from Dana Perry. Uh, it's a 2004 Carry All One 48 volt loses power when going uphill. Well, what do you think I'm going to, to ask on that? I'm going to, my first question is, what is the situation of your batteries? Uh, because you, you should lose a little power going uphill, but, uh, you know, not necessarily a lot. So I, I would need voltmeter readings off your batteries, and then I could talk you through some ways to, to do a load test with your batteries and see if we can find one of them that's dropping out uh, quicker than the others. Okay, and this one is from Jack Methner. He says, Howdy, my 2000 TXT sometimes has 
hot wired the power switch no key switch I have a new key switch to install but it appears that someone cut in different colored wires I've looked at the diagram I don't see the wires on my cart that show on the diagram well this is where you need to know how to do a continuity test with a voltmeter uh, a key switch, you know, is just an on and off switch. So you just need to know how to do a continuity test using a voltmeter. Uh, it's very easy to do. You're just you're just looking for you're, you're going to hook your voltmeter to the to the back of the key switch, and you're going to see where the on and off needs to be, and then you're going to look at the wires that they tied together, so you know that was the on and off. So anyway, that may be a that may be a situation where you need to set up an appointment with me, and we can we can talk about that, and I can walk you through it. You can either call you can either set up an appointment with me as a phone call or if you have a smartphone or a device that you would like or like a, 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 a iPad or something you can set up a video call with me where I can actually see what you're talking about I mean I'm gonna what, what's gonna happen is that I'm gonna send you a link and you're just gonna click on it and then I can take control of your camera and and I can see what you're pointing at like so I can actually see everything that we're talking about you know on my screen so you can set that up at golfcartgarage.com on the home page. There will be a gearhead on demand link like this, like this banner on the wall right here. You click on that and you see all the available time slots. You pick one that's convenient for you. And at that time, I will send you a link. Either myself or one of the other technicians at Golf Cart Garage will send you a link. And we'll see if we can, we see if we can help you out. Let me go back and look here at uh, YouTube, see if there's anything on there. Oh, well, looks like we're good on there. All right, that's going to be it for me this week. We will be back next week to answer more emails and more questions and see if we can help some people out, see if we can save them some money. Don't forget to go to golfcartgarage.com and enter our sweepstakes, Extreme Golf Cart Makeover Sweepstakes. You can win $3,000 in store credit. I mean, that's uh, you could do your own golf cart extreme makeover yourself with $3,000 in store credit. Uh, with only a couple of more weeks to enter, it's going to it's going to be the winners are going to be picked November 20th, I believe. So you only you don't have much longer to went to to enter. So go to Golf Cart Garage to to enter for that sweepstakes. Now, also, if you're having trouble with your golf cart. Uh, you need to you feel like you need to talk to someone you might want to talk with me you might want to talk with one of the other technicians at golf cart garage just go to golfcartgarage.com look for this look for this link for gearheads on demand click on it you'll see the available time slots I'll send you a link all you do is click on it and I'll be there or one of the other technicians and we'll see if we can help you out so thank you very much everyone I will see you next week the garage is now closed <laughs>